Well, good morning, everybody. Again, glad you're here. Uh, last week, Pastor Sharon led us through another one of Christianity's dangerous ideas uh, in, in what was referred to and what is referred to as, as Paul's household codes, the way that we treat one another within a household, the, the behavior of husbands, which we know always needs work, the behavior of wives, which is always stellar, the behavior of children, which... Uh, <laughs> the behavior of, of children, uh, the role of master and slave. They, they were made clear to the people of Colossae through Paul's writings. And what made it a dangerous idea was that nowhere else in the Greco-Roman world was this the case. You didn't speak of the roles of someone else within the household in a public setting. Men would talk to men, women would talk to women, uh, slaves would, would talk to one another about uh, the way they're, they're treated. But Paul set out in these household codes for the first time ever, he set them out specifically and in writing where a slave could now read what the master was expected to do, how he was expected to be treated by his master, how a slave was to act toward his master, how wives were to be treated by their husbands, he laid it all out. It wasn't a secret anymore. It just lent to this transparency of the Christian movement, of people following Christ. This is how we behave. This is how we act. So totally spelled out, not just to the person who bears that responsibility, but to, to everyone. And this is what made it dangerous. Everyone knew the expectation. Are there to act? how they're to see other people, how, to, how they're to value other people, and how they should expect to be treated by other members of the body of Christ. And these codes are spelled out at the very end of Paul's letter to this church in Colossae. And we've talked about this village. It's a village upstream of two major cities. Each one of these cities are, are six and nine miles away. Heropolis and Laodicea, both are wealthy cities, and we've talked about why that was. Heropolis, it was because it was a military city. It had soldiers, it had the families of soldiers living there, it had businesses that catered to the military context in Laodicea. Well, it was wealthy, it had all the money it needed. It was the home of the Roman mint. It's where the Caesars made their money, literally. And again, we talked about the fact that there had been this earthquake in this region just a couple of years before Paul wrote this letter. And the earthquake flattened all three of these cities, Heropolis, Laodicea, and this village of Colossae. Colossae is a dying town, so we're not going to invest anything there. But Heropolis and Laodicea, they deserve our investment. So Nero sends a stimulus check to both cities. Laodicea returns theirs because they're proud of how rich they are. Heropolis says, we'll take that. And they rebuilt quickly. Both cities were very, very well off. But even while this little village of Colossae is dying on the vine, the Christians of Colossae are growing in their faith. They're maturing. They're beginning to, to get a grip on what it means to walk in Christ. They're learning, they're engaged, they're doing well. And Paul, who's writing this letter, he's under house arrest in Rome. And he's heard good reports about this church. He's heard great things about these people. And he's sending them this letter of thanks and encouragement to the people. And he's coming down to the last bit of instruction. And last week again, it was these household codes. Now that we're part of the body of Christ, now that you are in Christ, this is how you live and act. This is how you behave toward one another. Then he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, earnest, and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. So what's the message? And what door needs to be opened? Well, Paul's under house arrest, and he's waiting for an audience with the Caesar. He's been arrested. He's still a Roman citizen. 
and he's waiting for his turn to talk to Nero, the most powerful man in the world at that point. Can you imagine? He says, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. The same message I'm telling the Colossians I'm going to tell to Nero. What an opportunity. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And you, do the same. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, those who don't share our faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This week, that's been my prayer for for our city, for our church. Listen to this again. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What if we all did that? What if every conversation we had in this city or in the greater notice metropolitan area, we'll, we'll, we'll call it that, what if it was seasoned with grace? Now in the last paragraph, Paul lists 10 of his fellow workers. Some of these names show up in a, a few of his other letters too. But this is what he writes to the people of Colossae. Tychicus, okay, say it with me, Tychicus, wonderful name. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. You may not know him yet, but Tychicus is a good guy. He's a fellow servant, and he's got important information that I want you to hear. I want you to get it firsthand. Paul says, he's coming with Onesimus. Let's hear it, Onesimus. There you go. (laughs) He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They, the two of them, will, will tell you everything that is happening here. So, the letter is written. The letter is, is, is at its final goodbye. He's saying, I'm sending it with Tychicus and Onesimus. And they're going to tell you what's going on. Onesimus is one of you. It's going to be carried from Rome to Colossae by these two men. Tychicus, a stranger to them. Onesimus, he's one of them. Paul says, he is our faithful brother. He's one of you. And Paul goes on talking about men who are kind of in his orbit there in Rome, because even though Paul's imprisoned, it's kind of like house arrest. He's not free to leave, but Paul's friends are able to come and go. They're able to, to minister to him, to get him what he needs. He says, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And then Paul interjects a little note here. You've inst- in- <laughs> you have received instructions about Mark. If he comes to you, welcome him. Then he writes, Jesus, who to avoid confusion, we call justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. The- these two men, being Jewish, they come out of the same faith heritage that I do. They understand the prophecies. They understand that Jesus is both the Jewish Messiah and the Savior of the world. Epaphras, again, who is one of you? And a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. He prays for you with an insider's knowledge 
of who you are, the people involved, the, the places, the, the dying city of Colossae up against these mammoth wealthy cities. He understands. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters down the road at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. In fact, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Another name, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. That's a long goodbye. And here's the end. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. See, typically, well, oftentimes anyway, Paul would have somebody take dictation. Scholars aren't sure. They think maybe Paul had a, a vision problem or arthritis or, or something like this, and he often used a scribe to write the letters. But this was an important note. And Paul says, I write this greeting with my own hand. I haven't dictated it. Remember my chains. Remember I'm in prison. Grace be with you. So this letter that we've been through for 10 Sundays is carried from Rome to this little church in Colossae. It's a long way. A long way. But there's another letter. It's a note, really. In the pocket of Onesimus. Remember, Paul said, he, he's one of you. Our dear brother. And it's written by Paul to an influential man in the Colossae church. And even though this is an influential man, his name does not show up in Paul's bigger letter. It only shows up in this little note that happens to be stuck in the pocket of Onesimus, a man named Philemon. In fact, a lot of scholars believe that it's in Philemon's house that the church of Colossae actually gathers and meets. So wh why wouldn't Paul talk about this gentleman? Why wouldn't he send his greetings to this gentleman in his first letter? Because, in fact, Paul does mention Archippus. That's Philemon's son. So he mentions the son, but doesn't mention the, the name of the man who's the father, but also the, the church meets in his home. There's more at play here. See, this second note that happens to be stuck in Onesimus's pocket isn't really intended for, for public comment or to be read publicly but we have it. The second note deals with a, a private and highly sensitive issue. And it's an issue that could actually blow up this church of Colossae if Philemon, when he gets the note, doesn't read it in the right way, in the right spirit. Paul has just been through so many things in the, in the big letter. And in our Christian faith, our precepts have to become our practices. We have to, as Christians, implement policy. For example, when, when Jesus says, forgive as I have forgiven you, what should be our stand? To just say, yes, that's that, and then refuse to forgive? No, there, there comes a time when precept has to become implemented. We, we have to do what Scripture says, what it tells us to do. And Paul has written this revolutionary statement that we, we come back to, even when we're not studying Colossians, this revolutionary statement that says, in Christ there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. 
That statement and, and the household codes that Sharon walked us through last week are about to be put to the test big time. And it can go well or it can go badly. And it will then set in motion, if all things go well, among the followers of Jesus, the kingdom principle that when we live in Christ, when we live in Christ, grace and forgiveness trump justice. Grace and forgiveness trump justice. Grace and forgiveness trump justice. Now here's the back story. Onesimus, this, this man who has made this, this journey with the note in his pocket, this man who is one of them, as Paul says, and a faithful brother, has a big problem. Here's his problem. He's a fugitive. He's a runaway slave. We don't know how long he's been gone, but before he left, he stole from Philemon, took things that didn't belong to him. He ran away, fled Colossae. He left the family that owns him, and he made his way to Rome where he could very easily find himself lost in a city of several hundred thousand. It's a good place to be lost if you don't want to be found. And the scripture doesn't tell us, but somehow <clears throat> he made his way to find Paul. And scholars believe that it's because Philemon and his son Aristarchus and the people that, that met in this home spoke so highly of Paul that he had to find him for himself. He may have actually witnessed Philemon go from being a non-Christian, just following the, the current of the Greco-Roman culture. He may have seen what happened when Paul led Philemon to Christ in Ephesus and seen the change in his life and thinking if it could work for my master, maybe it can work for me too. The people of the church have spoken highly of him. So what did Paul write in this note that's in the pocket of a runaway fugitive slave to the slave master? Now first, the letter to Philemon is, is written by two people. It's written by Paul and his apprentice, Timothy, who's in Rome looking after Paul. And Paul writes this. On this note that's stuck in the pocket of a fugitive slave to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, who is Philemon's wife, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, their son. And to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you. Then Paul talks about how he's been praying for these people, praying for this church, praying for Colossae, and how he values their partnership. He knows that they are praying for him. They keep him encouraged. He knows that they are partners in helping to spread the gospel. He appreciates how they're growing in their faith. And then personally, Paul says, Philemon, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. This work that you're doing in Colossae among the people that comprise your church, that meet in your home, you are keeping them encouraged. And that's a great thing. I appreciate what you're doing. Then Paul gets to the point of this note that's being handed to Philemon by the runaway slave Onesimus. He says, he says I'm going to ask you for something. You don't have to do it. I could demand that you do this, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to make my appeal to you, Philemon, out of love in grace, in forgiveness, not justice. Love, grace, in forgiveness. Paul stresses the point that he is not some kind of religious authority who is there on some kind of a power trip to coerce Philemon to do what he wants. He's not doing that at all. 
Paul is much more courteous, much more tactful, much more intentional in asking that this be done out of love as the only motivator. I'm not going to coerce you to do what I want. It's just me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It's me, Paul, who's appealing to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you. He was a bad slave. Look at how he behaved. But now he has become useful to both you and me. See, Paul had an obligation too. You cannot harbor a runaway slave. He has to go back. He has to go back. And Paul says, I love this guy. I love him. I'd like to keep him because he's helping me the same way that you have helped me. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. Why? So that any favor you do would not seem forced but voluntary. Paul knows this is not his decision to make. This is not his conscience having to weigh a decision. But what he is doing is laying out the kingdom rationale for asking that it be done. See, in this other letter, the big letter, what's going to happen is they're going to walk into Philemon's home. The church will gather they will read Paul's letter and it will say, Masters, here's how you deal with your slave. It will say, Slave, here's how you behave in front of your master. And I guarantee you, every eye in the place will look at those two. Right? It's going to happen. So he sends, he has the courtesy, he has the tact, he has the good manners to slip another note in addition to the big letter, to Philemon. It's kind of a heads up. It's kind of a, there's a big decision coming. And I want you to weigh the consequences of your decision. We've just made public the role of husbands, wives, children, slave masters, and slaves. It's going to be a defining moment for this church and as news gets around to Laodicea and Hierapolis and Ephesus and all these other places, this could set the standard for how we deal with issues like this. Because Philemon, the law gives you incredible latitude when it comes to punishing this man for what he has done. Right up to death. You can take his life. It's within the law. You can do that. But again, Philemon, love, grace, forgiveness has got to trump justice. It has to. And if you actually believe, Philemon, that in Christ there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Doesn't that make Onesimus, this fugitive, this runaway, doesn't that make him more than a slave? And Paul observes, he says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, no longer is he a common commodity. You can get another slave anywhere, anytime no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Then Paul says, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. He says, if Onesimus has stolen from you, if you feel like you've been mistreated, if he's embarrassed you publicly, charge it to me, Paul. If it's justice you want, if it's justice that you want to elevate, above these other more more important factors, I'm willing to take that on. Assign his penalty to me. 
I'll pay it back. I'll make the amends. If justice is that important to you. Because see, finally, this runaway slave is following your household code. He's returning to make amends. He's re- returning to face these consequences. He's obedient to this role within the household code. And he is here now, better than before, ready to work for his master as he works for the Lord. Philemon, who has every right to have justice meted out on this runaway, knew well what he could do to penalize this man. And he also knew that Paul is right there ready to take on that penalty if that's what he called for. Even though Paul is is the man that has led them both to Christ, he's their, their spiritual father in that regard, Paul won't use that as leverage against either one of them. He refuses to do that. And he doesn't use the fact that he led them both to Christ as, as any presumed authority over their lives. He simply, simply asks both to reconcile. Sometimes reconciliation costs something. For Onesimus, it meant he had to return, guilty of, of thievery and, and slavery and flight. And Philemon, it was going to cost a little bit of grace and an offer of forgiveness on the basis of love. All three of these men in Christ, brothers in Christ, equals in Christ. And Paul's there in the middle, ready to take on the punishment if justice wins over grace. You ever go to some of those movies and and you just leave scratching your head and wondering, is that can't be the end? I mean, there, there's got to be more to this. How, do, how does this story resolve? Well, here's one of those cases. We don't know how it resolves. We don't. We have no idea how the story ends. We don't know what Philemon decided to do. All we know is that Paul never made it back to Colossae to visit his friends. He was martyred in Rome. But there are some things in this story that that we have to pay attention to. We, We have to take away. We have to build them into the lives that we live, both as a church and as individuals. First thing is the precepts have to become our practice. Whether it's Jesus saying, love one another, whether it says, forgive others as I've forgiven you, we have to do that. We can't just have a precept, a a Christian standard, this thing that we believe wholeheartedly and then not put it in the practice. If there's somebody that you need to forgive, forgive them. If there's somebody that you need to go to to ask for forgiveness, go make the ask. The precepts of Christ have to become our practice. Second thing. Again, we have to understand that where we stand today, on this side of eternity, Grace and forgiveness trump justice. There will come a point in time when each one of us are resurrected ourselves, when Christ calls us home, where justice won't matter. Right now, as human beings in this world, justice can be our greatest ally or our biggest weakness in our faith. Because sometimes we elevate justice with a righteous fervor, but we don't have the same righteous fervor for grace and forgiveness. You know, and I I doubt, we don't know, but I doubt that Philemon would have ever asked or even considered having Paul paid, pay for Onesimus' crimes. 
Do you think he would have done that? I don't think so, because we have in us this human tendency to make sure that justice is assigned to the right person, don't we? We hate to see justice misapplied. We want to see the guilty held accountable. But what we want to see the the guilty held accountable, grace and forgiveness have to rule. That has to be the code we live by. The third thing is agreement in the body of Christ. Now think of Philemon and his church that meets in his home along with his wife and son. Agreement in the body of Christ is motivated by a mutual love for one another, not by coercion. The last church that we were in, a long time ago, I worked for a senior pastor who was that way. He wanted his way. Sometimes his way was the correct way, but not every way, not every time. But he would use coercive and manipulative, you know what I'm saying? Manipulative ways to get his way. That has no place in the body of Christ. Love is more powerful than heavy handedness. And it's the way of Jesus. Whatever you do, do it out of love. You know, because I said so may be a perfectly reasonable reply to a four year old, but not within a mature group of believers. Love is the way of the church. Love is the way of Christ. And if we are in Christ, we are all part of the body. Each one of us plays a role in it. Love, love will keep us together. That just came to me. That's not in my notes. You know what I'm saying? We have a world that is crying for justice. The problem happens to be, and I was thinking of this in Sunday school this morning, doctor, everybody has their own definition of justice. We have have lost the objective standard for what is good and what is not good. We have to remain faithful or we will lose our way. We have to remain people who will give grace. You know, undeserved favor toward others. We have to remain the people that will forgive. We have to remain the people that ask for forgiveness. That's what motivates us. That's what animates us. That's what makes us do what we do. And we need to keep doing what we do. Let's pray. Father, this is a, just a remarkable story. And when you see how it weaves in and out with this book of, of Colossians, how Paul saved this for the very end because it was going to be such a key moment in what he's asking of Philemon, of Onesimus, and of this entire church, Father, to not let the rule of law supersede grace and forgiveness. Father, again, we are such uh, mysterious creatures. We want justice. We want to see justice done. There's There's a rightness to it. But Father, how often do we go to you asking for justice, but only when it's in our favor? Not when we've wronged somebody, but when somebody's wronged us. Help us to remember, Father, that you showed us grace that we didn't deserve. In fact, while we were yet in our sin, while we were yet in our sin, you died for us.
Father, help us to be very, very careful. Help us to be real careful in our call for justice in these days. Never let us people that are so zealous for justice that we forget that we have been forgiven. We thank you for the gift of life, Father. We thank you for these household codes. We thank you that Christianity had dozens and dozens and dozens of dangerous ideas that have worked themselves throughout culture over millennium, and now we take them for granted. We, we thank you that they are there, but Father, help us never lose sight of what you have designed for Christian community. Help us to be an influence this week in our city and among our neighbors. Again, Father, help us to be people of grace and forgiveness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.